The first thing to know with episode 6 is the title. That being the world in a little girl's eyes, the struggle for trust part 2. In terms of the episode's narrative, clearly it implies that most of what we'll be seeing will be through Mikasa's eyes, both in terms of the present day events as well as the flashback which takes up more than half of the episode. Though as with many things in Attack on Titan, these titles often have more to them than meets the eye, and in this case, I think this one actually carries a double meaning, because it can also be applied to Emir. Namely, both Emir and Mikasa have seen the brutal realities of the world which hardened them and turned them into the people they are today. Or, I guess to be more precise, 2000 years ago. You could draw plenty more parallels between how both of them were exploited for things beyond their control and so on, but point is, in retrospect, considering how important Emir's role would be in Eren's story and, by extension, Mikasa's, I think you can easily refer to Emir with this title as well. And if I were to titularly overanalyze the series, there's another little girl we meet in this episode who would also mirror the younger and more hopeful version of Mikasa, where her being saved by Mikasa is parallel to how Mikasa was saved by Eren. So maybe this could even have a triple meaning. Okay, I do admit that is a stretch. Though moving into the episode itself, we open soon after we left off, with Armin still being completely paralyzed by what he saw. And while Connie is trying to get a grasp of the situation, Emir speaks up, calmly saying that everyone is dead, that the only survivor is Armin, and that they don't have any more time to waste on him. And this is one of those scenes that I really appreciate a lot more with hindsight, as I distinctly remember that on initial viewing, I always thought that Emir was a very bland character and frankly didn't care for her at all. Whereas now, her seemingly brassy nature obviously has a lot of bases behind it. With the real Emir now being the primary talking point, I think it's easy to forget all the terrible, terrible things that this Emir has been through. So it's no surprise that these events, while still shocking, don't really scare her as much as the others. And on top of that, as we'd see later both in Season 1 and 2, she has an almost uncanny level of perception, with her correctly identifying Sasha's insecurities about her accent, Reiner's split personality, among others. So in this case, I think there is an argument to be made that from her perspective, Armin really is weak and isn't worth the trouble. Remember that at this point in time, Armin is still a nobody. And from her point of view, all the strong fighters of his squad were just wiped out. So staying around any longer is simply a waste of time. And the other major thing with Emir to note here is Historia once again stepping in and trying to peacekeep as usual. And it's as she does it that we see the other side of Emir brought out. The much less cynical and kinder side. And while at this point we obviously can't quite pinpoint her true personality just yet, it's just a hint at the fact that this confrontational side is merely a protection mechanism resulting from all the messed up things she's lived through both back in Marley, as well as more importantly, those 60 plus years as a pure titan. And because I know this will immediately pop up as a question, the 13 year curse does not apply to pure titans. So she spent those 60-ish years mindlessly stumbling around parody as a pure titan, and only then did she randomly stumble upon the Marley squad where she ate Marcel before their first attack on Shiganshina, got the Jaw Titan, and it's only then that her 13 year countdown began. But more on that when we get there. As for Armin, Connie tries talking to him, but he apologizes for being a burden and flies off on his own. As far as this scene goes, I think Connie trying to offer him his hand just reminds him of Eren again, which is what pushes him over the edge. It's just that familiar sight of seemingly everyone always trying to pull him up. And before we move on, I just want to talk about the tone for the rest of the episode, as it will be relevant for basically everything following this point. First off, something I briefly touched on last time, notice the weather shift we've seen ever since Eren's death. The entirety of this episode, both in the present as well as in the Mikasa flashback, is shrouded in dark clouds with the only exception being the very brief flashback of a flashback we see. And as much as I am that one annoying friend you have who constantly says that rain is one of the most peaceful weather settings, in this episode, it of course implies anything but that. In both timelines, we are seeing tragedies unfold, and broody weather just furthers that overall tone. 
especially in the context of what we've seen in episodes past. Aaron is the one who inspired many of them to join the Scouts to begin with. He was their glimmer of hope for humanity. Yet here, we see both him and his entire squad devoured. And to signal that, that glimmer of hope is gone and dark clouds appear in its place. Secondly, the music. This will of course depend on the person, but to me, the music we hear here as well as throughout much of this episode is one that we hadn't really seen yet. Namely, it almost being just ambient background music that isn't just sad. Rather, it goes through these cycles of emptiness as we hear that choir. And then sorrow as we hear those slow and deep strings. Which I think goes to speak about Armin's mindset during this entire thing. He just feels hollow. Clearly there's sadness and anger mixed in there too, but above all, it is just emptiness and confusion. And speaking of Armin, let's talk about his inner monologue. Where he has this thought that the world never truly changed and that it has always been hell. Again, like I mentioned with the dark clouds, notice how Armin and Mikasa would be directly mirrored throughout this episode. For both, we see how Eren saved them. In Armin's case, that was of course just from some petty bullies. But in Mikasa's, it was literal life and death. And both just lost their savior. Though the thing to keep in mind is that for Armin, it's not just the fact that he lost Eren. It's him being ashamed of ever standing in front of Mikasa again. And that is reinforced by his memories. Notably, the book we saw in the previous episode's flashback. When Armin was being bullied, it wasn't just him being scuffled up. His dreams, signified by that book of the outside world, were being crushed as well. And again, Aaron and Mikasa were the ones to step in and stop it. So at this moment, he has lost everyone, both Aaron and Mikasa. Because again, he feels like he can never stand in front of Mikasa and tell her that Aaron died for him. And another detail that I found tragically beautiful here is that even his ODM gear hooks don't properly grip. It's just a literal manifestation of absolutely everything going wrong. Even without any additional threats, a simple maneuver failed miserably and he smashed into that cold brick wall. And as if that wasn't hammered home enough, we also see the goofy couple of Hannah and Franz we saw at the graduation party. Though here, that goofiness is gone and Hannah is just hopelessly trying to resuscitate the clearly dead Franz. And here too, Armin's words carry a double meaning, as him telling Hannah that she has to accept his death is the same exact struggle he is going through right now. Especially the line of, there's nothing that can be done for him, makes you wonder who is he even talking about? Is it really Franz or is it Aaron? We then cut to the gates leading into Wall Rose. Here too we get some more good old classist representation as we see even the soldiers being helpless simply because they're afraid of the bureaucratic nature of the walls. Though in terms of the episode's overall narrative, multiple times we'll be seeing the phrase the strong preying on the weak, which also applies here. In the context of the society living in the walls, we see the same exact sentiment represented. Because in the eyes of the public, he holds massive wealth, therefore he holds massive power. And so despite their lives being threatened literally every second that they stay here, they still see themselves as powerless. But right on the heels of that, we get this interesting dichotomy as Mikasa shows up. We see this titan as derpily as usual rushing toward the gates. And to hammer home the idea that Mikasa is an absolute monster, we even hear these other soldiers say that chasing it down would be impossible only for Mikasa to do just that in a few seconds flat. But anyway, that's beside the point. The interesting part here is what happens after she sees the commotion at the gates. As we now have two very different sides of power. One is very literal, as Mikasa literally stands on her prey, while the other is of course much more philosophical, as the rich guy keeps screaming about getting his stuff through the gates. And those dissonant, almost horror-like strings in the background as Mikasa tries explaining the situation really captures it extremely well. 
Because to her, she has put her life on the line to protect these people. Yet this dude is one, endangering literally everyone here, and two, not even appreciating her sacrifice as he says that, well hey, that's just your job, isn't it? There's a much, much bigger debate to be had here around times of crisis and who really is the most important in all that, but that is far outside of this video's scope, so let's not get into that. Point is, the dichotomy of power in this scene is just very well executed. Oh, and just like I said last time, seeing her dunk on this dude was just a ton of fun because hey, obligatory commentary on messed up society is always a win. And the last thing in the sequence is the little girl that thanks Mikasa for saving her. And while yeah, like I said at the top of the video, you could see this as a triple meaning for the title, I think the Occam's Razor way of thinking here is that it's just a parallel to how Eren saved her, and now she is paying that forward. With the evacuation continuing, we see another example of the series playing with weather. Because now, a proper storm begins, implying that everything we've seen was just the calm before. With everything we'd see from Mikasa in the following episode, yeah, I'd say that the worst is still yet to come for her. Because remember that in-universe, Mikasa is still unaware of Eren's fate. And again, the whole weather thing would also come full circle, but let's not rush ahead. One last small scene we get here is of Mikasa talking to her team leader, as she explains that she accidentally dulled her blades with a single blow. Which nicely leads us into the mid-card explaining the quote-unquote Ultra Hard Steel. Not to be confused with regular steel. And with what we just heard of Mikasa, just like it did for her team leader, you are simply left asking, who is Mikasa really, and what is up with her inhuman strength? And that mystery would of course be compounded further in just a little bit as we get into our flashback. But in a broader sense, I think the blades and the ultra hard steel are just another case of subtle world building, as it's just yet another example of how the people in the walls have attempted to optimize every single facet of their lives to live with the titans, just like we've talked about with the wall mounted cannons already. An even more pronounced version of this sort of world building would come later with the ice burst stone, but more on that later. And with that, we get into the meat of this episode, the Mikasa flashback. First and foremost, this is where a very important thing about the Ackerman heritage is revealed that would cause a lot of confusion later on. And thankfully, a friend of mine warned me about this before I started working on this video, because I was just as confused. In this episode, we see Mikasa's mother talk about this embroidery pattern that has been passed down through generations, which on initial viewing might not have seemed like a big deal, but with everything we learn of later in the story, I think it's heavily implied that it's the same pattern that will be revealed as Mikasa's tattoo way later into the final season. And as I think most anime onlys did, I immediately began questioning my own sanity because we have seen Mikasa's hands, and there was no tattoo to speak of. And as it turns out, this is either an anime only plot hole, or the Attack on Titan story is actually so much more complex than I could ever even comprehend and is actually a multiverse. Again, I haven't yet touched the manga myself at all, but a friend of mine told me about this scene specifically when I brought it up after the episode with the tattoo reveal aired originally. Apparently, the anime changed this scene to be embroidery, whereas in the manga, they always talk about Mikasa's wrapped up hands. And on top of that, Every single time we see Mikasa's bare hands, which clearly has no tattoo in the anime, is also a mess up on the animation fronts, as it is always covered up in the manga. All multiverse jokes aside, at this point in the anime story, I honestly couldn't tell you why it was changed in season 1, and why the tattoo popped up at all considering it was never present in the anime, and in the grand scheme of things, its presence isn't even a huge deal in the story. So yeah, I just write this down to an animation error since it is essentially just retconned into the final season. Whether it has any deeper meaning than what we've learned already, I guess is yet to be seen. But as of right now, that should hopefully clear up any confusion about it for my fellow anime onlys. Though in a broader sense, the tattoo itself being hidden actually has another angle to it which many of us in the western world may overlook. Put briefly, tattoos in Japanese society are super taboo due to their links to the Yakuza, to the point that entering hot springs and other public establishments is often banned outright. 
With the changing times and globalization, the stigma around them is of course slowly changing, but I think there's still an argument to be made that in the context of Attack on Titan, that historical taboo is another reason why Mikasa keep it hidden in the first place. As for the rest of the flashback, first off, note how this is one of the rare shots in this episode which are properly lit and have a warm color palette, even despite a storm raging on outside. Considering this would be one of very few and short happy scenes in this episode, it just works to visually contrast the darkness that surrounds basically everything else going on. As for Mikasa, this is obviously a far cry from the cold and composed person we'd know throughout the series, as here she is just a normal and joyous kid, immediately implying that something must have happened to make her that way. Speaking of which, it is then that we hear a knock on the door. And one thing that I absolutely loved here is the transition, because we cut to Grisha and Aaron on the outside also knocking on the door, clearly implying that it was them who knocked just a few moments ago. Hi! But that is of course not the case, because this actually takes place far, far later. Just like I mentioned with the Armin flashback transition in the last episode, it's just some excellent direction that subverts expectations in an extremely subtle and clever way, so I just love that. As they open the door, however, we see that Mikasa's parents are already dead and that she herself is missing. We then cut to Aaron, who is clearly shaken to his very core as he sees death and the brutality of the world on full display. In the broader story, I think it's just a scene to further drive home the idea that Aaron has never really changed. Yeah, he's saving Mikasa in this sequence, so obviously he is more than in the right, but everything he does here, no matter how heroic, is not a normal thing for a 9-year-old to do. Keep in mind that this is Aaron who has lived in relative peace. All of this is pre-Shiganshina. So this scene of him looking almost detached from reality just encompasses that cold nature of his we see later in the story. And another thing I think is easy to overlook is Grisha in this scene. Remember that he has the Attack Titan, and remember that he was explicitly told by the Owl that he must protect Mikasa. So the question arises of, how much does he actually know at this moment? Has he already received Eren's memories at some point? Or is this truly him being baffled by the situation unfolding? Or maybe he realizes that this is the situation the Al was describing in the first place. Or could it be he even knew that he had to leave Aaron alone and that it has to be Aaron who saves Mikasa? Just a scene that in hindsight leaves you asking many many questions considering everything we know now. Though as we cut to the kidnappers and Mikasa, we get another instance of us being told that she is in fact different. And it's these tiny bits of lore that are dropped in cases like this that just bring up a million questions. For example, here this guy says that there were once many races out there, but now Mikasa is supposedly the last of the Oriental clan and that her family, quote unquote, escaped to the walls from the Orient. So now you're left asking, why did they escape to the walls? Who even were they? If there were these Orientals, then surely there were others too, right? Just to name a few. As we'd get to Marley and see the wider world, we'd of course see exactly what that meant, as we were introduced to a number of entirely different cultures. But as of now, it just cooks up that fundamental mystery of what's beyond the walls extremely well. Because again, remember that this is just episode 6. We are still absolutely clueless about basically everything. Though it's only after we see the aftermath that we finally cut back to the original knock on the door and actually see Mikasa's father open them. Only to find out that it is not in fact Heisenberg who knocked, but rather three dudes. And a tiny detail that I absolutely loved here is that we are actually always shown that there were in fact three people. In many many shows, the third person would be hidden in the shadows for the sake of surprise later on. Whereas here, if you're paying close attention, you always know that there were in fact three dudes. What I'm getting at here is that when we see Aaron take the two of them down, if you had noticed the third, you'd be on the edge of your seat the entire time because you already knew that it wasn't over. But if you didn't notice it, Mikasa reveals it just in time for the surprise to still be there anyway. 
So, in essence, it captures two separate emotions. One is uneasiness and anxiety for those who caught the third silhouette, while the other is that moment of surprise in case you didn't catch it. Just a solid example of direction that doesn't rely on hiding its surprises for them to actually still carry emotional weight. As for Aaron though, he of course goes to Stabby Town and that's the end of those two. And the thing to note here is his mentality. As we've already heard and as we'd continue hearing throughout the entirety of his story, to him, freedom is a fundamental value every single person should possess. So in his eyes, these people denied me because of that. Therefore, these people are just as bad as the Titans. They took away her freedom and they do not deserve to live. Oh, and an absolutely wonderful detail here is what the kidnapper says to Aaron once he knocks on the door. Because he says that kids shouldn't be walking around the forest alone and that there are wolves out there. Meanwhile, Aaron is literally a wolf in sheep's clothing here. So yeah, that backfired very, very quickly. And I also think that in many ways, this parallels Emir as she got her founding titan as she too became an absolute monster that appeared to be just a little girl. As far as him going berserk goes, I'm no professional so I won't try to diagnose his actions here, but clearly this isn't exactly 9-year-old behavior. Stabby Town jokes aside, if you look at it even from a semi-realistic psychological perspective and ignore the fact that he's just an anime MC, this is brutality incarnate. He stabs the dude at least seven times. Because this is a video about anime, I don't want to derail the comment section into Aaron stands trying to roast me alive, so TLDR, Aaron has always been messed up. And while he is clearly fighting for the good in this case, his methods are pretty extreme to say the least. Which also tracks considering the rumbling, because that is just ensuring safety because there is literally no one else left. Though with him freeing me, Kasup, she casually mentions that there was also a third. And it's then that we get some of the most mysterious scenes in the entire series. The third kidnapper grabs Aaron and it's then that he mutters his, at this point, signature phrase. And while all of that is great, we then see present day's Mikasa's narration kick in, saying that her entire life she has seen the strong prey on the weak time after time. And finally saying that, in an instant, her body stopped shaking and she was in total control. And I want to emphasize the since then part, implying that it's been like that ever since. And lastly, we focus on her pupil, which has also changed. And then that signature Titan Lightning swirls around her body as her power is awakened. And before we move on, here I want to call on all of you, because as much as I've tried looking for a reasoning behind the flower-shaped pupil, I just cannot seem to find any explanation behind it. So I thought, okay, it's just a stylistic decision, right? But then in One Piece, a character pops up who also has a distinctly shaped pupil. And again, okay, there are characters in One Piece with all kinds of eyes, but is there something in Japanese mythology that talks about the significance of this exact type of pupil or something? If anybody has any clue, I'd love to hear more, but again, it could just be a stylistic decision. That is totally a viable option as well. But anyway, returning to Attack on Titan, even in the present day, the extent of Mikasa's true power and the mystery of exactly how the Ackermans work is still there. But we've got some clues here that I want to mention. First off, the since then part implies a permanent change. A flipping of a switch, if you will. In the final season, Aaron would claim that all of this happened because the Ackermans were essentially designed to protect their hosts, implying that he is her host. Though in retrospect, it's pretty clear that he was lying since neither Kenny nor Levi ever exhibit those type of traits. Almost certainly he said that simply to distance himself from Armin and Mikasa to protect them. And on top of that, Zeke would outright say that according to the Marley Titan research, their powers awaken when their survival instincts are triggered and that there is no such thing as these quote-unquote hosts. It's simply some sort of genetic quirk that is triggered purely out of survival. Then we have the conversation between Levi and Mikasa in Season 3, both of whom are of course Ackermans and both of whom exhibit inhuman strength. Here too we hear Levi ask Mikasa whether she has ever felt a power awaken in her. 
And when Mikasa says that yes, she has, Levi explains that both Kenny and him have also had those moments. Moments of absolute clarity as to what they should do next. Again, implying that it's merely survival instincts kicking in. Though importantly, we'd also hear that her parents were hunted because they were Ackermans, which would be contextualized further once we learned that, just like noble families, the Ackermans are immune to the Founding Titan's power of wiping out memories. And finally, we know for a fact that despite their immunity to the Founding Titan's power, they are still subjects of Amir since Mikasa II was pulled into the paths once Aarons addressed them. So putting all of that together, I think there's an argument to be made that for one reason or another, the power of the Titans somehow ended up with the Ackermans as well. And similar to that of the Titans themselves, once it is activated and the person is aware of their abilities, they can use it semi-freely. As with all things in anime, there is a possibility that the whole lightning thing is purely visual to convey a sense of power, but considering it is nearly identical to the Titan lightning we'd see later in the series, I just refuse to believe it wasn't intentional. If I were to make a guess as to how they even came to be, considering King Fritz forced his children to eat Emir and that's how they split her power, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he might have also tried some unconventional methods to try to empower his soldiers, which might have somehow created a genetic mutation that works in a manner similar to that of the Titans. This is further backed up by the fact that the Marley Titans fear the Ackermans basically as much as any other Titan shifter, which implies that even historically, their unprecedented power must be well documented. I've also seen some theories about how there might have been a Romeo and Juliet type story sometime far earlier in Attack on Titan, and because of that, the Ackerman bloodline basically became Titans in human bodies. And then of course the unresolved mystery in all of this are Mikasa's headaches, because neither Kenny or Levi ever mention anything about them. And Zeke would also say that nothing like that has ever been reported. Considering Eren's importance, I suppose you could say that Emir might be in some way affecting Mikasa as she is the closest person to Eren, because again, he'd be the one and obviously the first to free Emir, Mikasa would also be the first to feel Emir's effects. But yeah, I guess we'll just have to wait for part 3 to see whether we get a concrete explanation of that. And as usual, manga folks, keep the spoilers either tagged or out of the comments, thank you very much. Okay, anyway, all of that was a very, very long-winded way of saying that Mikasa's dormant power is awakened, she goes full-on Titan mode, literally breaks the handle of the knife, and one-shots the last kidnapper. And one last thing, notice the attention to detail. After the soldiers walk in and are stunned by the fact that a pair of kids did this, we see that the knife's handle is indeed splintered from Mikasa's grip. So yeah, just a nice bit of continuity. Though cutting to the outside of the house, we see Grisha lecture Aaron about putting his life in danger. But again, Aaron just says that he killed beasts that just so happened to look like humans, and that if he had waited for the police to show up, it would already be too late. Though here, it's important to note that this is one of the memories that Aaron and Zeke return to, meaning that, most likely, he was receiving memories at this very moment. So, yet again, you are left asking how much does he know, and how much did he know before all of this? As for Mikasa, it's here that the cold and distant personality we know is essentially born. And the following scene captures that beautifully. As all Mikasa asks is how can she get back to her home and that it is cold. Clearly she is traumatized and that complete bewilderment we see here just embodies all that. Though most importantly, it's Aaron's response that sets everything in motion as he takes his scarf, wraps it around Mikasa, and tells her that she can keep it. In the wider story, I don't think it's surprising that Mikasa would really see Aaron as a person she's forever indebted to. Picture yourself in a life and death situation, then this person comes in and saves you, suddenly says some magical words that awaken your true inner power, and after all of that, is the first one to accept you with open arms. For a traumatized young kid, it's no surprise that he does seem like a deity at this point. He literally freed her in so, so many ways. But even throwing all the huge foreshadowing and everything else aside, man, is this just a wonderful sequence. Even when taken in isolation, the bond that is forged between them here is so, so clear. 
And that moment of Meek so just breaking down in tears, realizing that she isn't alone in this world is just beautiful. So yeah, as with all things in the series, in retrospect, clearly this one is much more bittersweet. But even knowing that their love story, as far as we've seen so far at least, doesn't end in happily ever after, it is still a very, very touching scene. As we return to the present though, we get some more excellent direction, because everything we just saw is actually presented as Mikasa's inner dialogue as she is meticulously wiping out the Titans one by one. And before you ask, yes, I will point this out every time. I just love it when flashbacks aren't just jammed in for the sake of an exposition dump, but are rather presented in a more in-universe manner, which in this case, I think worked extremely well. But of course, the worst part of all this is Mikasa's closing statements, saying that she knows she has a place to return to, and that as long as Eren is here, she can do anything. This is just one of those perfect examples of information asymmetry between the characters and us as the audience. Because everything we've been shown so far is building up why Mikasa is so incredibly strong, and how her love for Eren fuels all of that. While to us, this entire episode has been setting up Mikasa's collapse, because again, Eren is everything to her, and as far as we know, he is dead. And so this entire episode has that emotional dichotomy of the dark clouds, the somber music, and everything else of that nature that describes us as the viewer, because we know of Eren's fate. While in-universe, Mikasa is still unaware of that fact. But with that said, that is episode 6. One that is actually still one of my favorites to this very day. Definitely a much more character-centric one than some of the ones we've seen so far but still absolutely packed to say the least. In retrospect, I kind of wish we'd gotten more of these deeply personal character-centric episodes, especially between Eren and Mikasa, but hey, you won't catch me complaining about the pedal to the metal storytelling we see later on either. At the end of the day, these episodes have set up the narrative arcs very, very successfully, so maybe there is just no need to meander about their past that much. But anyway, next time we'll be wrapping up the Mikasa mini arc and getting into proper Titan shenanigans. So hopefully, I'll see you back then as well as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Another big one, but definitely a fun one if you ask me. I know I say it a lot, but it's still wild to me how much the show changes on a rewatch. Literally every episode becomes like one and a half times longer just because there's an entirely new dimension to all the scenes that we are totally missing. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.